Hello, I'm Colin Green, and you are listening to Spike Pit. Why is it that I've got this annoying tendency to get into something or have something pop into my mind at the, at the least opportune moment? I'm back to thinking about gaming with uh, youngsters, getting this school club off the ground. But I question the wisdom because uh, in September we'll have a new intake of students. It'll be my first proper year as a qualified teacher and should I really be taking on a role-playing game club uh, out of the gate like that? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm going to be seeking the advice of veteran school or veteran school club gaming group organisers or DMs. How would you phrase that? Not like that. Anyway, um, yeah, veterans of the school gaming club, unite, give me some advice. It's the old story, procrastination phase to start with. Um, a little bit of initial enthusiasm, I guess, is the first stage. Then you move into the procrastination phase. Some of us uh, never leave it, um, it and it's typically an, a, a long and frustratingly swingy series of decisions for me and that is choosing the game initially now I've got a few contenders I thought about Maze Rats um, but I think it might be just a bit too simple not enough to get youngsters fired up I think um, I think that's the sort of game that when you've played a bit and you're looking for something simple, you appreciate the minimalist nature of it. But, you know, I could well be wrong. And I certainly will be using the tables because I use them all the time, as regular listeners will be aware. The other game I talk about quite a lot is ICRPG. Now, I can see the style of that book and, and just the whole look of it. The graphics really appealing to a, a younger age group and I always think that the designer has got quite a youthful manner about himself in a way. He 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 um he never seems to be all that pro or uh, child friendly. He he, he kind of goes goes to great lengths to say that he's he's not a child friendly YouTuber. And, yeah, I mean, I understand why. Maybe he worries about being a bad influence, certainly. Um, yeah, I mean, s some people would be would be um, put off but by, the, by the swearing and the drinking and stuff that goes on. And obviously, you, you know, you, you, you can't be um, holding hang up as a, 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 um, a great example. For, for children but then by his own admission he's not trying to be so that I don't want that to come across as a criticism but I love his stuff and I, I think he has got that youthful way about him and that energy that yeah I, I would actually love for him to have a more child friendly show because I, I, I think he'd be a great inspiration to young creators but that that's by the by um my my son mentioned the black hack. Of course, that's a favourite for me. Nice, con uh, I always recommend it as a, a really nice self-contained box set. But I don't know. It's got a lot of those tropes, and I don't know how well the tropes are going to go down with the 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 real youngsters. Um, which is one of the reasons why I thought that ICRPG might be a winner because it's so flexible. And then Black Hack, a bit less flexible. But I keep coming back. I keep coming back to Beyond the Wall. Um, my reservations with that 
are the same as my reservations with something like kids on bikes. Do kids really want to play kids? Will they think that you're trying to give them, you know, like a, a babyish game? You know, do they want to be big bad heroes? And if you're a kid all day long, do you want to be something else? Do you want to kind of get away from that? Apparently, my son, he quite likes to look up beyond the wall. And the playbooks are a really strong selling point because you can print them out, give them to a group of players, and it's got, uh, it guides you through what's what on the sheet. And in the context of a club, it would be nice to just hand them out, let people digest that, let the, let the kids digest that for a moment and, you know, answer any questions as you kind of like move around the group one by one. Um, I don't know. I mean, the answer is I'm going to have to test some some of this out. Maybe get a group that are keen to get involved, get them together, get a little hardcore. I'm probably going to start with the, the robotics club because um, I know those guys and they'll be able to clue me in on who to ask. One of them actually asked me the other day whether I liked Lord of the Rings. And <laughs> I don't know... Where that came from, we were just um, we was doing some soldering in a lunchtime, and he came over to me and, and sort of says, so, "Sir, do you, do you like uh, Lord of the Rings?" And I informed him that I did, and then and then it was a conversation about, "Oh, who's your favourite character?" and blah de blah de blah. And I it was just out of the blue, and I said, "Oh, you know, why is that? Are you, are you interested in?" kind of game, games around that theme or do you play anything on the computer and he's no not really so I don't know <laughs> maybe in his world all old old white guys like Lord of the Rings I don't know <laughs> um, but I, I always find you don't want to ask too many questions otherwise um, I don't know, it, it can be a little bit off-putting, like you're asking them 20 questions and sometimes they look like maybe they're, they're in trouble or they've done something wrong. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, I wouldn't say I've got a shortlist. That's not really a shortlist, is it? Hmm. Well, let's talk about what I don't want to run then. So I, what, I really want to get away from 5e on this occasion. Um... I play enough 5e, and the trouble with these big companies, and it's the same for like Games Workshop. My history is with D and D, Games Workshop, Warhammer, stuff like that, and I I could get really enthusiastic and nostalgic about all that, but I don't I don't want this club to be about me and my preferences. I want to try and tap in to whatever it is the kids are into at the moment. That seems to be the way to go because I want them to pick it up, pick up the ball and run with it and be running their own games and find some DMs that can run some games and just just get something self-sustaining. I don't want to be the DM kind of thing. Um, obviously, it'll have to start out like that, or I'm assuming it will. Maybe there will be some. Maybe I will discover some kids that are already playing. And there's even some murmurings amongst the staff as well. So we'll see how that develops. But I digress. I don't I don't want to also I also don't want to feel like that guy that is encouraging kids to go out there and sort of spend all their pocket money on books that in my experience are not up to it. They're gonna fall apart. They're not gonna stand up to the rigors of school life. And I think they're a bit of a waste of money. Uh, no, that's harsh. I don't mean a waste of money. I don't think you're getting perhaps as good a value as you could, as you could, or and certainly for the money you pay, um, many other companies do a much better job of producing their stuff than uh, Wizards of the Coast. And t to be fair, when you get into this hobby, it can be a bit like a, a drug habit. So I don't want to. I don't want to be seen as the guy pushing the big glossy, big brand names because uh, I just don't want to feel like a drug pusher, basically. Uh, same with Warhammer. You, you can lose your shirt, your house. You can, you can lose everything 
on uh, putting together a games workshop uh, miniatures based army and I want I want these kids to be a little bit more creative so um, I reckon something like Beyond the Wall or or particularly ICRPG uh, are good products for that. Black Hack, yeah. I don't, I don't, I cannot articulate my reservations with a black hack at the moment on that one. Um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe it assumes too much from the novice player. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm keen. If anybody wants to chip in on this discussion, uh, throw in a bit of advice. I mean, an obvious one would perhaps be, you know, the likes of Redbox, Basic, Mensa. But once again, I feel that's getting into my nostalgia. It's, it is a pretty decent book to learn the game. I could go down the, the road of some fighting fantasy. Perhaps, once again, that's... Am I, you know, that's, that's my history. I'm a little bit wary. And the other thing, of course, that you wouldn't realise as the listener is all the kids coming into my school now, they're all coming in with Chromebooks. And there's every possibility that this game is going to be run uh, without books. It could, in fact, be a big, um, intelligent, um, a big smart board, like a, a touchscreen whiteboard, like the teachers um, replacing the old teacher's blackboard. We've got these Promethean screens so maps and and that can go on up on on the wall and and they're virtually the size of a table it'd be like having a your table in a vertical um, position up on the wall and the kids could all log into the classroom i'd like to think we'd be rolling dice but if dice become a problem um, you know this this technology is just second nature for the kids so I've been getting more interested in in that because of my work, and I think um, it might be a little bit of an easier sell in the school if I'm saying you know we're we're promoting familiarity with these devices, so the kids you know the um, if if we can get them interested in the hobby, maybe they'll 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 get a little bit more proficient with using their d device and layout and stuff like that because the kids their idea of layout in google slides when they come into the school it's uh, pretty horrendous even though they're on devices all day they they can navigate devices but when it comes to actually being creative with their devices they they are not awesome obviously you you, you can't generalize but it, it is something that we have to work on and this might be a way to encourage them to to um, push push their limits a little and develop their their skills using the uh, Google Education Suite. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting, but uh, I could probably ramble on for hours about this. But let's draw a line under it. There, I feel I'm already repeating myself. Oh, Joe, uh, I know you like a bit of basketball. If you're listening, that uh, noise you can hear in the background is um, I'm at my son's martial arts and I'm backed up to a basketball kid a uh, basketball kid <laughs> backed up to a basketball court and there's a kid shooting a few hoops so that's that's cool he's spending the evening getting a bit of exercise shooting a few hoops whilst his his little brother's in there doing the old bit of the old Cobra Kai stuff <laughs> Talking to Joe, I've got some RPG adjacent news. Now, a little while back, there was loads of talk about what's better, vampires or werewolves. I'm fully in the uh, vampire camp. However, just lately, I have inadvertently got a little bit closer to werewolves. But because of spoilers, that prevents me from saying any more. Uh, over the uh, bank holiday weekend recently, I think it was bank holiday weekend, um, English Heritage had a uh, Vampires at Whitby Abbey uh, event, and it was to mark 
the 125th anniversary of Bram Stoker's Dracula. So believe it or not, in this uh, little town, Whitby, we've got the old ruined abbey up on the uh, up on the hill there, up at where well, sort of a cliff come hill, uh, quite near the sea. 1,369 people turned out you know, dressed as vampires to mark the occasion, and that was in fact a world record breaking turnout of vampires in one place. Must have been quite a a sight to behold. It was uh, vampires, young and old. I believe there was people turning up with their pets, uh, dressed as vampires. So, yeah, I, I didn't know it was going to happen. I would have actually have quite liked to have seen that, but Whitby is uh, quite a, uh, a trudge for me. I, I'm not sure the rest of my family would be quite so enthusiastic to go along to such an event. Talking of enthusiasm as well, segueing on to Spelljammer. The, the, uh, the hum is rising as the Wizards talk about their Spelljammer release. I never played Spelljammer back in the day. I'm, I'm quite interested to see what they come up with. I imagine it will be pretty faithful to the original. Anything that's going to save them money in terms of coming up with new design... I would think they will embrace wholeheartedly. A little bit cynical perhaps, but it, it's a business and these big businesses do like to pinch the pennies. Do they have shareholders? I don't know. Guess they maybe do. Hasbro? Must have. So we shall see. Um, it's an idea I, I, I'm, I've heard about Spelljammer and um, I understand the uh, the mechanism of the, the the vessels and the idea with the mind flares and all this business, but it's it's something that intrigues me, uh, and uh, I I really I guess I would like to know more, but I won't be picking up the book. Uh, perhaps check it out on D and D Beyond or enjoy it vicariously through others. Yeah, so I'm I'm watching that with uh, with some interest. I don't know if we've got any big old Spelljammer fans listening in that perhaps want to enlighten me a little bit more. I know, um, I know there's bound to be some because I've heard my my buddies and fellow podcasters talking about it. No end, it seems. Uh, well, I say no end. That's that's a lot of old cobblers. It's not no end at all. But I've definitely heard them talking about it. Another thing, I'm thinking of firing up the jungle in the not too distant future really enjoying Ravenloft but I imagine uh, DM Ricky will be wanting a rest at some point and it'd be nice to get back into the, the jungle I've been watching David Attenborough he's a, 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 a legendary presenter on the BBC over in the UK I guess you know he must be worldwide he's got a an, his most recent series is on plants some absolutely amazing and inspirational photography there for anybody um, interested in sort of plant monsters i love a plant monster and yes yeah, some of the, some of the things that plants get up to it is uh, jaw-droppingly amazing especially with the technology they've got in terms of the camera work on these uh, natural history programs now especially the ones that the BBC put out. I, I, I love the BBC stuff. I, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I think they, they just create some awesome stuff. They're, of course, not alone. But what I like about this series, I think they have like it's about 10 minutes at the end of the episode, a kind of mini uh, behind-the-scenes look at what went on. That, of course, fascinates me. I love to see a little bit of the engineering and the design going on. And some of it is really quite surprising and inspiring. Looking for a bit of inspiration, I was keen to um, get, get myself a little dose of nostalgia recently. Started watching the original Star Trek series, which I, I didn't know was available. I forget where I found it now. It's on, on one of the streaming services for free. Well, you know, uh, we, we're paid up to it. Uh, and it was uh, included in the price. I, I actually think the old Star Trek holds up 
uh, pretty well in some ways and then not so well in others uh, it I, I don't know uh, you you could criticize it but it was a long time ago now a long time ago and uh, it's just ah oh, there's just something great about it i i don't think i i sort of watched it patchily when i was younger and some of these real early ones i don't remember seeing it's um it's a nice nice way to spend a little bit of time you can sort of switch your brain off and chill out for a minute so i find i've found that to be most enjoyable what else have i been pondering oh yeah i was listening to um seth godin on his awesome podcast akimbo and he was talking about uh, giving presentations and writing down notes and scripting stuff and the whole business of how if you can either memorize what you want to say or really rehearse what you want to say all well and good uh, get it really um, polished this idea that if, if you just rely on your notes and scripts and, and things like that, it's a bit of a tell. It can be a bit of a tell, especially in a, in a business sense where maybe you're trying to convince people or you're working in sales or you, you, um, you're kind of trying to persuade people in some way. He, he was suggesting that you can come across as a, not really fully invested in what you're saying if you're working from a script if you're getting people together to basically read a memo, don't bother. Just send them the memo. You can spend time working it and polish it, get it perfect and send them the memo. If you know your stuff and you're passionate about what you've got to say and you've considered it and you take a little bit of time to think, he says that that the power of that is um, uh, cannot be understated. And it got me thinking, I I wonder, I wonder, is this something that could cross over into, into role-playing games? Um, who over-prepares, who writes everything down, who scripts their adventures, who's totally relying on uh, somebody else's product? And I'm wondering... Are, are we are we better GMs? Can we improve our, our DMing and GMing chops if we could be more spontaneous and, I don't know, just, just play off the cuff as much as possible? Is there something that is desirable? And is, is it, in fact, superior? You know, should we be really working on our maybe memory skills or... Or I don't know, I don't even know what. Relying less on all the, the books and the charts and the, um, the the written word. And should we be should we be going for that old style storyteller vibe? Uh, I, I'm sure there's plenty of DMs out there that are, are, are awesome at that. And I, I'm I'm just curious as to what people maybe think. I don't really have an opinion, but I think there's something there. And that, as they say, is a wrap. Big thanks goes out to you, the listener, for taking a bit of time out of your day to listen to old Spike Pit. Take care, and I'll catch you later.